Time is your greatest enemy. Phase one of the mission will be a low-level ingress attacking in two plane teams. You'll fly along this narrow canyon to your target. Radar-guided surface-to-air missiles defend the area. These SAMs are lethal. But they were designed to protect the skies above, not the canyon below. That's because the enemy knows no one is insane enough to try and fly below them. That's exactly what I'm going to train you to do. On the day, your altitude will be 100 feet maximum. You exceed this altitude, radar will spot you, and you're dead. Your airspeed will be 660 knots, minimum. Time to target, two and a half minutes. That's because fifth generation fighters wait at an airbase nearby. In a head to head with these planes and your F 18s, you're dead. That's why you need to get in, hit your target, and be gone before these planes even have a chance at catching you. This makes time your greatest adversary. You'll fly a route in your nav system that simulates the canyon. The faster you navigate this canyon, the harder it will be to stay under the radar of these enemy SAMs. The tighter the turns, the more intensely the force of gravity on your body multiplies, compressing your lungs, forcing the blood from your brain, impairing your judgment and reaction time. So for today's lesson, we're gonna take it easy on you. Max ceiling, 300 feet, time to target three minutes. Good luck. Come on, how many of you know Top Gun is the greatest movie of all time? Can I get an amen on that one? It was very quiet in the first service here this morning. I know Pioneers, you guys were cheering and clapping when the Top Gun clip came on. But come on guys, Top Gun is the best movie of all time. Can I get a few more amens here today? Like, is this church with me or you're not with me, okay? We're not putting some soppy romantic movie on the all-time list, okay? It's not Pretty Woman. It's not any of those things. Top Gun all the way. I had to just find a way to get a Top Gun clip in this year. I mean, after the movie came out, so I just figured, like, I just throw it in here. It's completely random, and there you have it. No, actually, we're going to talk about mission today. We, uh, we started, uh, last week, we started a new series called This Is What It Is. And if you weren't here last week, the appropriate question to ask in your head, you don't have to blurt out loud, is what is it? You know, which my wife said after I told her that that's the series title. And that's the whole point. What is it? And what we're seeking to do is answer just a couple of questions regarding our faith and regarding our journey with God. Last week, we looked at what is our message? And we answered it. We said, this is what it is. This is what the gospel is all about. And today, the question is, what is our mission? Hence, Top Gun. Top Gun, people, is your mission. Time is of the essence. Can I get an amen Yeah, today? Now, tonight we have a guest speaker as well at our Pioneer's location, and uh, Pastor Trevor Coleman, who's going to be coming to speak with us tonight, and he's going to speak on the, uh, the same topic, uh, but he's going to be talking about gathered to scatter, and it's all again about mission. So I wanna encourage you to come along tonight if you can as well. But so good to have all of those joining us at Pinus, and of course, uh, all of those joining us online as well. So come on, Durban Boyle, let's give them a great welcome this morning. Good to have you. Before I uh, get into the message this morning, of course, next week is Heart for the House Sunday. And uh, for those of you who are part of our family, you'll know that every single year we have an opportunity uh, for this, and so, on your seat uh, this morning, hopefully you never sat on it, is a Heart for the House giving envelope. And uh, we want you to take that envelope home this week. And part of your assignment is to continue to pray and to ask God what it is that He wants you to do. Hopefully you know. Uh, last week I, I had an encounter with God. I'm gonna talk about it next week. And I know exactly what it is that He's called me to do as clear as daylight because I believe in the mission of God, and part of this is about the mission of God. This is an opportunity over and above our tithes and offerings to be able to stretch our faith and sow into something that has eternal worth, amen? Yeah. And uh, there are different ways that you can give, and so you can come prepared next week. Uh, there's cash, although we encourage people not to bring cash where possible. Um, EFT giving, even if you do EFT giving, I'm gonna encourage you to still write it down on the envelope and just mark it off that you have paid it or, you, or you're going to pay it. Uh, because next week, uh, as we bring in, and then there's uh, an opportunity to do a pledge. 
Uh, because next week we're going to do two things. We're going to bring this envelope, and then last week um, you would have got one of these Heart for the House cards. If you didn't get it, you can find one at the information desk. And this card, on the back of it, if you read here, it says, what are you trusting God for? And we want you to bring both of these next week. The one is, what I'm trusting God for, as I sow my seed, I'm believing God to add to that so that we can continue to bring the vision. But there's something that I'm also trusting God for in my life. And we're going to drop both of those into the containers next week. And we're going to pray over both of them. Because I believe not only that God wants to do something through your life, but God also wants to do something in your life. Come on, how many of you know we can have faith to believe for both? Is that good? Amen. Awesome. Thank you for the five people who are responding to that. Well, come on, let's all stand. And uh, we're going to read from Acts chapter 14 today. And uh, we value the Word of God. That's why every now and then I like to stand. And uh, so we can just pay attention to it. Acts chapter 14, verse starting at verse 21. It says, They preached the gospel in that city and won a large number of disciples. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and, and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church and with prayer and fasting committed them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. After going through Pisidia, they came into Pamphylia. And when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to Italia. And from Italia, they sailed back to Antioch where they had been committed to the grace of God. Sounds like a Greek Mediterranean holiday, amen? <laughs> where they had been committed to the grace of God for the work that they had now completed. On arriving there, they gathered the church together and reported all that God had done through them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. I want to answer that question today, what? is our mission. Let's take a moment and pray. God, thank you for your word. God, I just pray that over the next few moments, you will truly speak to us, God. Not just my words, but your words. Not my revelation, but your revelation by your spirit. And so God, we open up our hearts to you this morning. We want to hear from you, and we want to be able to respond to your word in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. High five somebody next to you and tell them, what is your mission? Ask them, what is your mission? For some of you, it's just getting to lunch today. We're having lasagna. Oh, thank you, Jesus. What is your mission? I think everybody needs purpose. And everybody needs a sense of mission. Uh, I found myself, and I would call it my latter years. I think I'm over the first half. I don't think I'm going to live to 100. Um, I'm not quite 50, but I'm almost there. And, um, and I find myself in what I would call my latter years. And as I look into my latter years, there, there's a shift that begins to happen in your life. And one of the shifts that I find with myself is that I find that, and, and maybe this is particularly in men, I don't know if women experience it in maybe the same kind of way, but, uh, but, but certainly w w within men, uh, you begin to have the sense of like, you need to find some kind of mission. Just something to break the monotony of life, something to break just the everyday mundi mundane. And you, you know, in some ways, I, I think we design for exploration. Uh, Andre and I went hiking again, uh, this weekend, and it's an amazing thing how every time you get onto a mountaintop, you're always wanting to go to the next peak, as though you're going to discover the pot of gold on the other side of the next peak. It's never going to happen. It's never going to come. But there's this innate kind of desire for exploration, for some sense of mission, for discovery and finding something new and fi finding maybe a sense of purpose in within that. And I, th I, th I think there's so many different things that are mixed into that. And so and so as I got into these latter years, last year I decided that every couple of years I want to do something different than unique. And so I've been thinking about it and uh, pondering on it, and I've started to put together a bucket list. You want to hear my bucket list? I've just got three things on my bucket list so far, but they're okay. I, I want to swim Robin Island. I want to do the Robin Island swim. 
That's the one thing. I'm gonna do that when I turn 50 after I run my third comrades marathon. I'm gonna run, I'm gonna run, I'm gonna swim. Maybe I can run if I can walk on water like Jesus, but I wanna swim Robin Island. I, I wanna do this incredible hike uh, on a mountain called Mont Blanc, which is surrounded by three different countries, France, Italy, and Germany. It's an 11-day hike, unless you fit like me, you can do it in about eight days, hopefully, but, uh, but it's, it's, it's around this mountain in snow, rain, and wind, and all sorts of weather, but it just looks so exhilarating. I wanna do it. Uh, if you wanna do it with me, come speak to me after the service. Uh, I wanna do this thing called the Dryland Traverse. It's not as complicated as some of these other things. It's just a, a weekend run uh, over three days, about 45 kilometers. It's in the Otaniqua Mountains. A couple of my friends have done it, and I've always wanted to do it. It's, it's on my bucket list. Why? Because, because in some sense, I'm designed for mission. I'm designed for mission. And really, what I'm simply here to tell you and I today is that you and I are designed and it's in our DNA, if you're, a, if you're a believer here today, part of your DNA is that you are designed for spiritual mission. God has put something in your DNA. That's why when you first got saved, some of you will remember, you couldn't wait to tell somebody. Maybe you were anxious about telling somebody, maybe there's a bit, bit of fear but you couldn't wait to tell somebody and you couldn't wait to bring some friends to church to discover this wonderful message that has set you free from death to life. Why? Because you're designed for mission. Jesus talks about this in John chapter 20, verse 21. It says this, again, Jesus said, peace be with you as the Father has sent me. So Jesus was sent for mission. So I am sending you. And then in Mark chapter 16, Jesus says to his disciples, he makes it more clear. He says, go into all the world and proclaim the good news to who? To everyone. And so we are designed for mission. Why? Because we're not just here to fill a building. We're here to fulfill a mission. And I don't know what you think church is all about. I don't know what you think a Sunday is all about, but I can tell you one thing it's not about. It's not yet to fill a building. It's yet to fulfill a mission. You and I are designed and created for mission, and part of my mandate is to equip you and to help you to understand the mission and the purpose to which God has called you so that you can go out and fulfill the God-given destiny that God has intended for your life. Now, I know for some of you, this is like, oh, Oh, this is so difficult because, because for some Christians, n nobody here, but there are other churches. For some Christians, I know, I know that, that, that they think that the, the, like the only mission they have is just to simply get to church. <laughs> like, like if I can get to church today, I fulfilled my part. And I know that for some people, how do I know that? Because the statistics tell us that, that the average Christian nowadays only comes to church once every third week, because it just seems so hard to get to church, let alone be the church that God has called you and I to. But the question I really need to ask is, is it my mission just to get to church, or is it my mission to be the church? So in order to answer that, we, we need to ask, well, what does mission look like? What does the church's mission look like? When we look at this story, it comes from the book of Acts. The book of Acts was also called the Acts of the Apostle because it's really the story, and I'd encourage every single one of you to read it. If you've never read it, or if you've never read it kind of in one or two or three sittings, go and read it like a novel. Read it, read it through. It's an exciting story of the birth and the establishment and the expansion of the early church. It's often called the Acts of the Apostles because it was the apostles and disciples who took the gospel and took the mandate that Jesus had given them to go into all the world and they began to expand it into all of the known world because that was their mission. Paul comes onto the scene. He was called Saul before he became Paul and he was actually a persecutor of the Christians. 
In fact, one of the reasons why the gospel scattered was because the church was persecuted and they had to flee. And they took the gospel with them everywhere where they went. And Paul was a persecutor of the church. They caused so many people to flee. But then he has this Damascus Road born again experience where he encounters God face to face. Remember his whole life he had been serving religion, looking to a form of God, but he had never encountered the living God. And he has this encounter with God. God removes the scales of his eyes and he sees God for who he really is. And he sees the depravity of his sinful nature, which is the gospel story that we spoke about last week. And he comes to salvation, and then he becomes one of the greatest champions of spreading the gospel in the early church. But his first formation phase was that he lands in a place called Antioch. Barnabas is actually the pastor at this church in Antioch, and he needs some help, and so he goes and calls Paul, and Paul comes to assist him for a period of time. And they spend a great amount of time building a significant local church. Paul was instrumental in the formation of this. And as you look at how they built that local church, you'll see a number of things. And I want to just work through each of them uh, just over the next few minutes. In verse 21, we see that part of their mission was that they won converts. They preached the gospel, they proclaimed the gospel, and they won many converts. We're all called to proclaim the gospel. The word preach simply means to proclaim. You don't have to stand on a stage. But what you need is you need a testimony. And when you know your testimony, you can share your testimony of what God has done in your life so that others have the opportunity to respond to that. And I would encourage you to spend some time understanding and knowing, first of all, do you have a testimony? Secondly, learn to, to communicate it, learn to cultivate it in a way and in a language that can clearly proclaim the gospel and the work that God has done in your life. The work that God has done in your life was not that I didn't used to go to church and now I go to church. The work that God has done in your life is I was dead in my sin, but now I am alive in Christ through the grace of what Jesus did, His mercy, His grace, at His expense for you and I. And I'd encourage every single person, go and spend some time cultivating that. You don't have to start with the person. Tell your dog. Start with your dog, then get your cat. Because a dog will much more easily get saved than a cat. Amen. (laughs) Cats are just resistant animals. (laughs) Then get your hamster and your goldfish. And then when you've got the confidence, go and share it with people. Because part of the mission of the church Part of what Paul and Barnabas cultivated in the church in Antioch was to win the lost for Christ. The second thing that we see that they did in verse 22 was that they strengthened new believers. This was discipleship that was taking place. Not only were people one for Christ, but they began to strengthen them and bring them to maturity. This is part of the reason why we have connect groups in the life of Urban Edge. It's an opportunity because your part of your mission is not just to win the lost, but it's then to cultivate new believers towards maturity. We believe that every member is a minister, which means that you have a mandate to make disciples, not just to make converts, you have a mandate to make disciples. That's why everybody needs to be a part of a small group. Why? Because you're not called just to mature on your own. That's not maturity. Maturity is when not only have you matured, but you can begin to help others on the journey of maturity. And the best place to do that is in a small group, in a connect group, where you can gather some people and you can help them. That's why Connect groups need to be messy from time to time. It can't just be us four no more. We're the spiritual lot and we're just growing in our destiny and we're just learning more and more and then we're keeping it all to ourselves. That's not maturity. That's not maturity. Maturity is when you take what God has done in your life and you begin to impart that to others. And every single one of us here can do that. In fact, we're called to do that according to the word of God. And then in verse 23, it says that they appointed leaders. They appointed leaders because the church needs leaders. The kingdom of God needs leaders. What do leaders do? Leaders lead. 
They expand. They move things forward. They take ownership. They carry responsibility in order to see something established. Now, they could have stopped there. And if they had stopped there, they would have built a significant church in Antioch. And they could have said, we've arrived. Look at our church. It's a mega church in this great city called Antioch. Paul and Barnabas could have drawn a great salary, had a great pension fund, lived out their dying days in Antioch, and then retired and said, Sarah, Sarah, flate, flate, my story is eight. But they didn't. Because there's more to the mission that God has for us. And so notice what came next in verse 24. After going to Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia. When they preached the word in Perga, they went down to Italia. And from Italia, they sailed back to Antioch. Notice what happened. Pisidia, Pamphylia, Perga, Italia, Antioch. In other words, they continued to plant and expand the word and the work of God throughout the known world. Paul and Barnabas never settled. I want to ask you today, is your kind of Christianity a kind that just settles? A kind that's just comfortable? A kind that just says, it's my church, my seat, my little space, in the way that I want it? Or is it maybe a little bit more uncomfortable? Hey, I'm a part of this connect group and we're so full, but more people need to come in. Oh my goodness, we're going to have to multiply. But yes, for the sake of the gospel, we're going to go from this house to that house, to that house, to that house, to that house, expand, expand. Come on, I, I know Pinus, you're clapping right now. Online, you are making some noise. But at Durbanville, these people are not totally convinced that this is the expansion of the kingdom of God. God wants us to expand. And we've had the privilege of being able to expand. We don't only have one campus. We've got a number of different campuses, and that's not where it's going to end. I know that everybody thinks, man, we've arrived, and this is great, and this is comfortable, but this is just the beginning of something more. Why? Because the mandate and the mission that God has for you and I isn't to settle, but it's to continue to take the gospel everywhere that we can. In fact, if you look at Paul's story, you'll notice in the Bible, and if you read in the book of Acts, that Paul embarked on three different missionary journeys. Now, it says four in there because the last one, he settled in Rome where he lived out his dying days. But he embarked on three missionary journeys. I don't know about you, but like, like Paul could have done one and gone, Shh, I've done it. I'm settled. But he didn't. And he's like, I've got to do more. And he went on another one and another one until eventually, if you look at that slide, the whole of the known world, the gospel went forth. The gospel went forth to the whole of the known world. Do you know why Paul did that? Why the other apostles did that? Because Jesus said, I'm coming back again. And they believed, they honestly thought that Jesus was going to come back in their lifetime. And so they couldn't wait. Come on, how many of you watched that Top Gun clip? Time is of the essence. You see, we wait because... We think that we've got so much time, and then one day our time is short, and then we go, God, what's going to happen to my family when it comes to eternity? What's going to happen to my friends? And by then, it may be too late, because there's no urgency in our hearts. But Paul and the other apostles, they had an urgency. And so when Jesus said, go into all the world, they took it literally. Yeah. Tell her, okay, well, let's draw a map. Okay, this is where the whole world lives. How are we going to get there? Come on, guys, we're going to go. We're going to do mission trip after mission trip after trip after trip. Why? Because we're not going to settle at Antioch. We're not just going to build a mega church. We're not just going to settle in our ways. We're not just going to make sure that everybody's taken care of you. No, we're going to raise up some leaders. We're going to have some disciple makers. We're going to have some pioneers. We're going to have some people who are willing to put everything on the line in order to take the gospel to the whole known world. Come on, I need a few amens here today if you're on board with this. You know, it wasn't easy for Paul to be able to do that. Don't think that Paul lived a comfortable life. I know that he went to all the wonderful Greek islands, but it certainly wasn't a holiday. In fact, if you look at Paul's mission resume in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, I'd encourage you to read it. I want you to see Paul's mission resume. Prison, flogged, exposed to death, 
Three times got lashed 39 times. Three times beaten with rods. Once pelted with stones. Three times shipwrecked. Constantly on the move. Danger from rivers, bandits, people, cities. Sleep deprivation. Starvation. Cold and naked. And then in verse 28 it says, Besides all of this, I feel it's the daily pressure of my concern for all the church. Come on. How many of you know this was not comfortable? Now I get it. Oh, got to multiply. They're asking me if I can use my house. Oh, I'm going to have to clean it, get it ready for a connect group so more people can be discipled. Like, ugh, who wants to do that? Now they want me to be a leader. Like, why? Why? Why me, God? This is hard. You're beating me. You're whipping me. You're leaving me out cold and for the dead, God. No, we're just asking for your home. just asking you to put your hand up to be a leader and disciple a few more people. We're just asking you to invite your neighbor to church for a Christmas carols play so that maybe they can come to salvation. I don't know about you. This is not difficult Christianity. This is easy Christianity. And maybe the reason why it's so difficult for us is because it's too easy for us. You see, did you know that one of the reasons why the gospel went to the whole of the known earth in those early times was because when you read in Acts chapter 4, chapter 5, the early church was persecuted. And they got so severely persecuted that they had to flee. But the beauty of when they fled to all other parts of the world was that they got to carry the gospel. Some of us, we feel life is so hard yeah, that we flee. No, there's nothing wrong. Go live in whatever country you want in the world. doesn't matter. That's okay. But I want to ask you, what are you carrying when you go? Are you just carrying your wealth? Or are you carrying the mission of God wherever you go? Come on. Like, if I don't get more amens, I can go. This is the last service of the morning. I can preach all day here today. Come on. God has called us to carry the mission. Why? Because people matter. The gospel matters. We're not trying to make bad people good. We're trying to see God resurrect people who are dead spiritually, dead in their sin, and make them alive in Christ. This is the greatest mission you can ever be committed to. Yes! Now you're doing better. Come on, partners. Give it up for Jesus. Why? Because we designated for this mission. As the Father sent me, so I'm sending you. As the Father sent me, so I'm sending you. Do you know that we've actually designed our church around these things? Did you know that? Some of you know, and if you've done growth track, you'll know this pretty well, that we designed it around four steps that we believe God wants every single person to engage in, and that's to know, grow, discover, go. To know God, to grow in freedom, to discover your purpose and go make a difference. And I think what happens in the church is most of us stop at know or grow. A lot of us know, but we don't even grow. Some of us grow, but we never discover the purpose for which we designed, and therefore we never go. Can I encourage you? Our mission at Urban Edge, we're not just here to get to church. We're not here to be contained in this little building, but our call is to go into all the world. The Bible speaks about it over and over. In Isaiah chapter 49, it says, The Lord said to me, I have a great task for you, my servant. Not only will you restore to greatness the people of Israel who have survived, but I will make you a light to the nations. Are you a light? A light to the nations so that the world may be saved. John chapter 8, Jesus spoke again to his people and he said, I am the light of the world. Man, it would have been so much easier if he just said, I, I, I'm the light of my family. I'm the light of my city. But like, that's a lot easier. But we're called to be a light to the world. Matthew chapter 5, you are the light of the world. Mark chapter 16, go into all the world and preach the good news so the disciples went 
everywhere. You are the light of the world. So how do we carry this out of the Let me just tell you a couple of things. You know, as you get ready to give into Heart for the House next year, th- these are some of the things that we get to do and be a part of it. Next week, I'll talk more in detail about some of the specific things that we want to engage in over the next year. And we shared that a few weeks ago already. But, but how do we carry out this mission of Durban Edge? Well, first, we have, we have local churches. We have local churches. And a local church here at Urban Edge, we designed this church not only for you to come and receive and to be able to grow and hopefully you get spiritually nourished, but we create it as a space for you to be able to invite people who are far from God. We're so intentional about that. We never want you to come here on a Sunday and feel like you have to give a reason or an excuse to your friend or somebody that you invite as to why the service was a certain way, but that you can invite them with a sense of freedom knowing that you have the confidence that on any given Sunday, somebody who's far from God can come and receive something from God. We, we run different events. I mean, we have amazing women's events. Come on. Uh, we, we had an amazing dream team party. How many of you were at the dream team party? Wasn't that awesome? But we have different events. We had a men's night a couple of weeks ago. It was the biggest men's night we've ever, ever, ever had. In fact, we had to cut it off. When, when last year we had a cut off a men's event, you know? And it's amazing. But you know what was more amazing? How many people invited their friends? Why? Because it was such an opportunity for people to come and hear the good news about Jesus Christ. We do sermon series. We had a series on mental health for seven weeks. Why? It's an opportunity for you to bring somebody. It's a great reason. We keep adding services. Where we can, why? Because we don't want to get stuck. We never want to not have enough room for growth. That's why we need more volunteers and more people. Don't ever think, well, the church has got enough. Everything's hunky-dory. You know, I got here. My seat was clean. Everything was fine. No, we need you if the gospel wants to continue. We have connect groups so that people can keep growing. We do campus expansion. We have three different locations. This is not to be cute, it's to keep creating space. We're involved with a, 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 an organization called ARC, which is a church planting organization. And already in the last couple of years, we've planted over 10 churches in South Africa, new churches, where the gospel is going forward. We have a mission in Lesotho. Just a couple of months ago, we planted another church in the city of Maseru, because we want to see expansion take place. And some of you may not know this, but up in Zambia, there's a great mission work, and we are financially contributing towards a church planter who over the next three years is going to be able to plant 35 new churches in unreached areas. Why? For one simple reason, Jesus is going to all the world. All the world. And the world is big. And so maybe for you and I, the simple practicality is is the best way for me to go into all the world is I start with my family, then I move into my work situation, then I work into my community, then I work into my city. Maybe, maybe Maybe that's your world right now. And thank God that as a church we can come together and we can have a world that's bigger than just that. I mean, the reason why we have missionaries in Lesotho, the reason why we can... Uh, support a church planter and give towards all sorts of other things is because of your giving and generosity. That's why Heart for the House matters so much because it goes towards things that fulfill the mission of God. Why? Because our mission at Urban Edge is connecting people to people and people to God. So where did all this start as I come to a close? Team, come on up. Well, if you read the chapter before and you read the story of Barnabas and Saul, it says there in Acts chapter 39, the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaen, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul, who of course became Paul. And while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. So after they prayed and fasted, they, prayed, they placed their hands on them and they sent them off. I want you to notice what happened. Set apart, laid their hands on them, 
And then Paul and Barnabas responded to the call and they went off. You know where it started? Was where the Holy Spirit came and gave them revelation of the work that they needed to do. And in order for us to be sent off, sometimes we need to set apart some things in our life. In fact, the word holy or consecrated means to be set apart. When you consecrate something to God, you, you set something apart. You, you set certain things aside in order to be sent off into the mission that God has called you to. And for some of us, we need to learn the art of setting apart in order for God to send us off. So, as I close, the question is, what do we need? If we're a church that is on mission, we're not a church that is just contained, well, we need things. We need pastors that are willing to go and plant churches. We need people to say yes to the call of God. We need leaders that can lead the mission locally and wherever it is that God has called us to, leaders that can be daring. You're on a mission. There's going to be missiles. You could be dead. If you go too slow, you're going to be dead. If you fly in the wrong direction, you're going to be dead. If you pull up uh, just you know, short of when you should pull up, you're going to be dead. Are you saying we're going to be dead? You, well, maybe you could be dead. But it's worth being dead because it's when you make yourself dead that you truly become alive and God begins to fulfill His mission in your life. Come on, some of us, we need to die to some things in our life so we can become alive to the things that God has called us to so we can fulfill His mission and His purpose in our lives. We need people to finance the mission. You know, some of you, the reason why God's given you a business is not for you, it's for the kingdom. You don't know it because you haven't set it aside yet. I want to say to you, for some of you, you need to be working hard, not so that you can work hard. You need to work hard to finance the kingdom. That's why God's given you a gift, but you haven't understood it in terms of what God has got purposed in terms of those things. Some of us can finance the kingdom. We need volunteers to continue the mission. More people who are sitting in connect groups who are saying, okay, include, I, I heard Sean's message, include me. Okay, okay, I know we've got to multiply. I mean, okay, you need a house. I'm not gonna be flogged. I'm not gonna be beaten. I'm not gonna be left for the dead. It's just a house for one hour in the week. I mean, come on, we need some volunteers to say yes so that we can continue on the mission. So I want to ask you today, what is your part? What is it that God has called you to? Because you're not called to fulfill somebody else's part. You're simply called to do what God has called you to do in Jesus' name. This is the greatest mission you're ever going to embark on. It's the only one that will last forever. Your life will come and go. Your business will come and go. Your money will come and go. You'll leave an inheritance and then your kids will waste it. So don't leave an inheritance. Give it all to the mission of God. Okay, no. <laughs> but the thing that matters is the mission that God has. So that all might come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Come on, has this helped you today? Amen. Can we give God a hand? Amen. Let's all stand. We're going to pray. Time is gone. Just bow your heads for a minute. I want to ask you just maybe one question as we pray. What do you need to say no to in order for you to say yes to the mission of God? Maybe there's some things in your life. Maybe it's comfort. Maybe it's fear. Maybe it's just apathy. Maybe it's something you're holding on to. Maybe it's a lifestyle. Something you need to say no to so that you can say yes to this great mission that God has called you to. I'm gonna pray that God will give you 
the strength to say no to the things that you need to say no to in order to say yes to the things you need to say yes to. So God, we come to you today and we thank you. We thank you that you've called us on purpose for a purpose. And I pray that mission will become part of our DNA, will become part of our lifestyle, that our testimony will be our message, will be our weapon that we can use to open blind eyes so that people can see the goodness of your gospel. Thank you that you've called us and you want to use us in Jesus' mighty name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Come on, let's give God a hand one last time. Amen.